Now, very happy to say we have a man of many talents with us, Liam Griffin, who you'll all know uh, through Wexford, through uh, the Griffin Group and his many brilliant hotels and I'm sure other ways besides as well as with us. Liam, I was just thinking because we had you on a couple of weeks ago, I was just saying to you before we came on air there, every time I've spoken to you over the last couple of years, it's about the bloody CPA and about the fixtures. I thought we might try and talk about something else. Yeah, yeah I'd welcome that actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No so... Life at the moment, obviously not easy for people in your uh, business. I suspect the recession and the crash was becoming a bit of a distant memory and then your circuit punch like this. What's it been like? Oh, look, it's been really tough. I mean, from our perspective, we just, we were only still coming out of the crash. <clears throat> we had still some stuff outstanding from the crash that we were trying to clear up. And, you know, obviously we didn't need this, uh, but neither did anybody else. And uh, we have a very loyal staff all over the place um, and then a great team. So, you know, you feel for all of those people. So, but look, at the end of the day, life matters and, and, and saving lives matters and, and doing the right thing matters. And while we are in a pandemic and it is difficult, we'll get through it and uh, we'll live to fight another day. <clears throat> you know, and we get up off the ground and go again. Mm -hmm. So, because when you've got a lot of people with you for a long time, you have a lot of responsibility towards those people. It's not just the customers and it's not just social distancing. You know, God forbid any one of our people who come into work and go home with COVID, like, and cause a problem at home or for themselves. So, like, you've got to kind of balance it all out. And then, and on balance, we'll make it and we'll get through it and uh, we'll put it behind us and we'll go again. We've been picking ourselves up since I started in business. So, mm. it's not a big deal to pick ourselves up again. And hopefully, hopefully, it'll fly again when we get going, you know. And from a business perspective, does it work that, like, I guess the bills and the overhead stop coming in, you shut your doors, the staff go on the PUP and you just kind of wait it out or is it far more complicated than that? Oh, well, it is. It's more complicated than that. It really is more complicated than that. But <clears throat> you're dealing with human lives at every level here. So so everybody, everybody that's involved in your organization and outside it is absolutely afflicted by this or hamstrung by it. So... You know, you've got to give a bit of a thought process to it and say, all right, what's what's what what's the most important thing that matters here? And the most important thing that matters is that we don't continue in this pandemic and that we save our own people and as many people as we can. Now, the only thing that would concern me is that the government, well, lots of things concern me, but the government are paying a lot of money into people like us. We don't want their money if we could help it. We never went looking for their money ever. Uh, and we, if we didn't have it now, we wouldn't be in business. And if our staff didn't have it now, they'd be in a very poor way. So we have to accept that. So that's as big an issue as the pandemic, you know, because the next generation are going to have to pick up a lot of tab here. And you'd like to see how, how we can make it more cost effective while saving lives and doing all of those things. Mm. And I just feel the only way to do that was to measure by numbers, was to measure by the numbers that we needed to get down to and by trying to get the, the certainty on the vaccine. So to close the gap between the numbers and the vaccine seemed to me to be the answer. And talking about all sorts of other side issues distracted from it and brought you into all sorts of crazy theories and all sorts of nonsensical stuff. But those were the matrix, I think. Mm. And I think if we'd have followed those matrix, when it gets to this and we get that, then we're in the home straight. And we haven't got there yet. And you'd like to think we could. So what's missing now? What's missing now is, where's the vaccine? What's the, what's the, what's the projections? Where's the scenario plan for the, when the vaccine comes in? And what numbers do we need to reach to get there? Tell us both of those and then we'll all know where we're going. Mm. Will a lot of hotels never open again after the back of this? If you weren't viable before this, I find it very difficult to see how you could be viable after this. I just do. I really do feel that you know how. What would it, you know? That's that's a given. I think. But to be fair, like it's so sad to see. At the, on the one hand, so many people who come out of vulture fund systems and themselves, and our business was sold to a vulture fund as well. We were performing at the time, but it was sold to a vulture fund, and. You know, that whole vulture fund, you could talk all day about how unfair it was, unfair to the crowd of people in New York who never entered Ireland. But the government, they make a decision, they took the money, therefore that had to be all sorted out. But it'd be a pity to see someone who has survived that go, go, go down because they would still be in the throes of getting out of that when this thing has come in. So it is a tsunami and it's a tsunami that came out of, out of nowhere. And of course, the biggest thing as well is that we didn't clear enough national debt before we started out here. We had come out of the pandemic we were carrying 220 billion of a, of a debt 
and I actually said it much to the derision of some of my own family members even, and from other people as well, that I made a point in the paper, why are we not paying down something off it? What's going to happen if something hits us? And you know, and behold, what hit us? We got hit with something much worse than I could ever imagine. Mm. But if we'd have had 20 billion paid off of that national debt, we'd have paid a lot of the money that's going out now. So now we've got hit by a double tsunami. We have paid none, down none of the national debt. And it seems to me that if you don't do a cost benefit analysis on what it costs not to have the vaccine, you're looking at paying money out every single day that's dead money completely because we can't get the vaccine in. What's it costing on a per day basis to keep so, 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 so subsidizing business and subsidizing the people in business? And what's the cost of that? And how many vaccines would that cost per day? Mm. You know, that's, that, that needs to be really looked at. But will that get the, will get the, get the vaccine any quicker? I don't think it will. Mm. What was the perk in the pandemic for a second? What was the landscape like in Ireland when it came to the hospitality sector? Do we have too many hotels, too few? I know Dublin, there's talk of shortage of beds. I mean, it strikes me as a tough industry at the best of times. It is a tough industry. It's a Cinderella industry. And it's also it's also a... If I might say so, it's a trophy gathering business as well. So, you know, you're not going to let you own a hotel. <clears throat> That's what it looked like in the end of the 90s. Mm. And then we brought in a system, which was a, a, a tax system, a uh, favorable tax system for uh, to develop new hotels. We were existing hotels. We hadn't got that benefit of that, but we were doing other jobs and we had to get the benefit of that to put our, our, our own figures. We had to have some element of that as part of our funding. Otherwise, we felt we're not going to be here because we're funded by a completely different model so then we over hoteled and uh, we had trophy assets going in with big builders uh, and that's all due respects to them you know i mean they thought it was a good idea but you don't take a table for six in the middle of your own restaurant <laughs> at eight o'clock at night time <laughs> you know you know you don't eat your own manure <laughs> you know it's, you don't get in the middle of the way when people are trying to serve people who are paying your way so a lot of stuff happened that was a bit crazy but however the crash was inevitable because of the hotels that were being built and if, the, if they were all going to be filled, we were going to have pollution for the ordinary citizens of the country. We'd have had too many people that were going to fill all the beds. So there was no scenario plan about this. And that happened by the changing of board faulty into a new board that had no, no jurisdiction over the development side to see that it was, under, it was, it was viable. And I worked for board faulty myself way back when that system was in place. So it just went mad. And uh, now we have a situation whereby you just wound up that the whole ethos that started just before the pandemic was that the uh, the governance on, and the VAT and the, uh, looking at the VAT rates was based on the fact that Dublin was being packed at that particular time and doing very, very well, but the rest of the country wasn't. So that, that was brought in and that actually was a crippling effect on the, on the, on the, on the domestic economy in rural Ireland. Mm -hmm. That was never ever factored in properly. And that, that, that was a massive mistake. So and then the failure of the regulators during the during the crash, the failure of the Irish regulator, the European regulator, and they walked away with free cars and they walked away with full pensions and the whole lot, while everybody else picked up the tab. So yeah. we've had a lot of crazy governance, and we need to look at, at how we how we how we manage ourselves after this recession, uh, which is going to happen. And uh, we need to look at the systems that we're offering, and need to be transparent, much more transparent than they were. Uh, and we need to continue with a scenario plan that's presented to the nation. That's basically it. it must, uh, you must find yourself a frustrated onlooker a lot of the time because the way you're talking here, incredible parallels with the way you'd come on and talk about the fixtures, you know, and with the CPA, you dived in and tried to do something about it, trying to do something about the way the country and government is that bit harder, I suspect. Do you? I, if I spoke to your kids, would they tell me that um, dad reads the paper and tut tuts and curses and shakes his head when he's watching the news and reading what's going on a bit? Uh, no, my guys are older. In fact, my one of my sons is CEO of the company now. Uh, if dad goes on the paper and he makes statements that the uh, boys cringe at, um, see, I come from a different era, right? Uh, I come from an era whereby, like, we started off at nothing with this world. My dad was a guard. Mm -hmm. And they had a small little hotel and my mother, they were, I got an Entrepreneur of the Year award, but I can tell you this much, my parents deserved that Entrepreneur of the Year, not me, they started with them. Like from our perspective, you know, you either toughed it out in the trenches or you were going to be buried alive. Mm -hmm. So I come from a completely different uh, background to my own kids, even though they came from a good work ethic. They would say that I brought them into work in hotels, washing up in the, in the, in the, in the kitchens, which I did. And I did it because I did it myself. It was a good sauce for them. I made them not appreciate people who work at that level. 
and the men's team came. I put them up on butter boxes with no shoes on them. You know, so <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> they only got small hours, but they they morphed it into twenty five hour days and all sorts. So yeah. look, family business, and they're part of it now, and they're fourth generation family business technically because my grandmother during the economic war started off a farm guest house with my mother. So we were, we were a long time at this game. So yeah. you got to but you got to slug your way out of the corners of it. <laughs> the same as in nanny, and the same as in sport. Yeah, I was reading. I know you trained in Shannon, did a stint in Switzerland and board Fulch in London and then worked a little bit in Dublin as well. I think it was 1974 you took the hotel off your your mum and Ross Lair, borrowed a 22%. Thanks very much to to do that. So that, that's a long time going. What age are you now, Liam? I'm 75 in September. And are you working as hard as ever? No, I'm not working as hard as ever, but I'm still working hard, to be honest, on my own side of things. But uh, I'm working hard on my fitness. I'm trying to keep myself fit and in shape, and I'm doing a lot on that. And I got a new replacement of an E last year, and I've got a few more things done, and I'm back. I'm going to be back running again, would you believe, Good after man. a long time. Yeah, but look, try to stay fit, because if I, can, I, I won't stay positive if I don't stay fit. And if I won't stay, I'm still, I think, sharp enough. Mm. Uh, my own lads would probably say too sharp on occasions, but... <laughs> That's that's okay. They're, they're entitled to stay there. So look, we're talking on the radio as well as here in, in video. You look incredible for 75. My God. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the collagen and all of those sticks and the facelifts and all the... <laughs> yeah, the it works. The, 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 I've had the jobs done and all of them. Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you oh, I, always, feel good. Look, I feel good. I feel good. I feel good. Yeah. You always strike me as somebody who had a natural enthusiasm for life and who had a natural work ethic uh, for life. Like, I, I don't suspect you were a man that enjoyed lying in bed in the morning till 11 or midday? No, I wake at seven o'clock every morning, no matter what time I go to bed anyway, so I never go beyond that. But no, I was always, look, at, I got it from my mother. My, my, I have my mother's genes, uh, I know I have. My mother would go 24 seven and not pull up for anything. But she was doing it to drive a family. She had come from a farming background. And, you know, my dad came from a farming background as well. My father's farm was an awful lot smaller than my mother's. He was from Clare or so. Like they were two fantastic people. I was so lucky to be born in with those people that mm. they worked so hard. But it was all for us. It was all actually that generation actually were really the war had happened and all of those things. And my mother was born, you know, before the First World War. And then this, you know, then there was the economic crashes. There was then the whole uh, war of independence. Then there was the, you know, with, with with England the war, economic war with England. Then the Second World War. They lived such through such times. So sometimes when I hear everybody saying about how hard this uh, the, you know, pandemic is, I often think of my mother. My mother's life was a, a, a total pandemic, if you like, mm. to a great extent. And yet she was brilliant humor and good singer and all sorts of things. So they did all that for us. And, uh, you know, I just I, I think I inherited my, my mother's genes because of her work ethic and her dedication to getting things done and seeing it off. And I think uh, I, I was cursed with it, maybe, but I don't think so. I oh, was happy no. to have it. No, it's a blessing. I have to fight hard yeah. to get out of that bed in the morning. Trust me, it's not a good gene to have that one. It's not easy. No, 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 no. Uh, no. How do you feel about aging? I mean, 75, does it, do you, do you, does it kind of catch you unaware sometimes? You think, my God, how has this happened? Do you, you must feel younger. What's, what's that process like? Because I, I, it's not something we talk about all that often, getting older, but I can't say I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and I can say to you this, that like in Ireland, like I'm, I'm four or five years younger than the man that's running America. You know, that's, that's a fact. So ageism is, is, has got a lot, a lot to do. There's a lot of people take a lot of things on ageism. But from my perspective, you know, an hour with a wise man is worth a whole study of books. And you cannot be wise unless you've gone through so much stuff yourself. It's all very well being an academic and being wise, and that has got its place in life. But you can also be wise from life itself. You can be wise from playing sport. You can be wise from so many things. So you carry so many facets that you can, that you can bring out. So I think it's wrong to dismiss people because they're older. If they've got, if they've got any kind of a head on, on their shoulders, mm. uh, they retain a lot of stuff that's of value to other people. So I would think from my point of view, do I like getting old? Of course I don't. Uh, you know, I'd rather be young again. I wish you could start all over again and go back around the clock again. So, mm. but I think staying positive is the, is the most important thing and trying to keep something in. Like I was in, in, in involved in sport. I always felt that, that sport was great for me because I could be passionate about something outside of my business. So if I wasn't passionate about something outside of my own business at the time, that meant that I was, I was, you know, really I would become 
uh, I would have thought, I always thought I got on well with my own staff. I always think I did. I would stay most, a lot of my staff are my best friends because I worked with them uh, more than, uh, you know, than anybody, as much as family, you, you know them so well. But I just think that if you don't have something to cling to on the outside, that, that, that helps to keep you, that it can actually distract you completely. Now, I was looking after under 12 teams and I would go to play a county final in Hurling against Buffers Alley one time. And I didn't care if there's no hotels left if, uh, for that couple of hours when it was because we were building a club at that stage in our own place in Hurling. So, but to take you away completely from your business side. And I think that you need something like that to, mm. to keep you going. And it needs to be something that energizes you and gives you, gives you some a reason to live. And being involved in the, in the GA certainly has been a major part of that. And as you get older, would you would you you know do things like a bucket list, or would you kind of reflect in your life and say, God, I need to make amends about that, or you know, I haven't talked to that person in twenty years. Does all that stuff start happening to you as you get older, or, or not really? It hasn't happened yet. But uh, what I did do was, um, I had a, 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 a little uh, box on my desk, and I used to write down what things I wanted to do uh, and things I wanted to achieve. And that was scenario planning, actually, by a different method. It was really a dreamer's um, uh, box, you know what I mean, if you like. And I have to say, some of the stuff I wrote about, I look back on them, I thought, Jeannie Mac, how did I think I could ever do that? But like by having those down there as a kind of a semi-roadmap or a semi-goal to do something, Mm. uh, you know, and that was absolutely uh, how much of that, that that was actually achieved, it seems beyond me when I realized that the hotel that I had come from, a small hotel that needed an awful lot of work, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in great shape at the time when we got it, you know, but I'm very proud I bought it from my mother because mm. I had two brothers as well. And my brothers and myself are very close. We ring each other every Sunday. We go, oh, it's going great now. We can, we can see each other as we've fallen asunder. But, you know, but we've kept that contact. And uh, I think that my buying the hotel was the right thing for me to do. And it was, mm. the, it was the right right move. So like from that moment on, when you go in on that level, then, you know, dreaming on from there and looking back at what, 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 what's been achieved. But it was never achieved without, without people, without, without teams of people over all the years and people who were very loyal to me and very loyal to our business. Mm. And I think loyalty matters. I think loyalty matters in everything. Loyalty matters in sport. Loyalty matters in, in, in business. Loyalty matters across the board. Your loyalty will be exploited sometimes. But so what? Hey, that life, the shit happens, you know, mm. and, and uh, you, you, you put up with it and you move on. But you don't lose your faith in humanity because of it. Mm. What about faith generally? I was uh, listening to you and you were saying even back in the Wexford days before going out in the pitch, everybody might say a, a prayer. So is faith, has that been a big part of your life throughout? Yes, my parents were very religious, to be fair. And I'm a practicing Catholic and, and, uh, and I'm actually proud of it. I had a phone call from a man two days ago, Walter Gallagher, and we talked about the clergy and all the things. 50, 62 years in Africa, absolutely uh, gave a life to it. Maura Gallagher's sister fought with Imelda Marcus in the Philippines, went up and wound up in, uh, back out in Chile, helping you know the underprivileged. All of these wonderful people that came from a religious background that were my next door neighbors. I was lucky, I grew up in a terrace of houses where we were in guards' houses. And we lived in each other's houses. If I was hungry and my mother was out, I went next door and grabbed the bread and just had bread and jam on my back hurling again against the wall. Hmm. You know, it was an amazing kind of a, but they went off to do that. So I would say that I was obviously inculcated with that. And it was a great example. And you know what? It hasn't done me any harm. And yes, we didn't scream and roar in this dressing room going out. We knew what we had to do before we went out. We did well planned. And we're in this dressing room just before we went out. We said, right, let's say a prayer. And thank hmm. God we're here. And thank God for the opportunity. And, uh, it wasn't anything that, you know, that anyone rejected. Some of those lads mightn't have a belief in the world. But you know what? It certainly was, was something that I felt we'd taken care of physical fitness. We'd taken care. I knew we had what we'd done on the training side. We'd taken care of all of the mental side. We'd brought in a psychologist when it wasn't normal. We had done all our stats. We knew what we were doing. We knew what was the best we could possibly be. We had followed a fellow called Shooter Bumper on the training manual of when he was leading the world leader at the time. We covered all of those things, endurance, speed and strength. We'd done all of that. So why wouldn't we take care of the spiritual side? Because, mm. you know, why not? We had done everything else, so mm. why not? And it wasn't tokenism, it was genuine. And I believe it, I believe, I believe it helped us, you know, I yeah. do. And I believe it helped me. Uh, I remember the night before the Ireland final, I went to Our Lady's Island, which is a place not far from me, which is a place of pilgrimage in Wexford. And I went there when I knew there'd be nobody there, it was going to get dark. And I sat down on a bench 
the sun was going down just, and I have to say, I sat on the bench and I never felt so calm in my life. And I made up my mind that I was going to be the calmest man in Crow Park the next day. That was my goal. That's what I was going to do. I had to keep my head, despite the crowd, despite everything else, and not be distracted. That was my job. I wasn't that I could, was going to Crow Park. I had a job to do in Crow Park. I needed to focus what's the job I have to do. And now I'm a one in a row all Ireland with the manager. Mm, <laughs> so, okay. You know, don't over get, get over carried away with your uh, achievements. Uh, one in a row is all it was. So I feel I feel uh, a bit of an imposter when you're talking about the Brian Cody's and all these fantastic managers, mm. and Sean Boyle and, sure. and Mick O'Dwyer yeah. and Kevin Heffern and, and Jim Gavin and all those fantastic managers that have done that for so long. I just I bow the knee to them every time. They're the no, men. No, I, I hear you. But all the same, it was a great one in a row. And it's a one in a row which people remember for lots of reasons. You're one of those reasons. And I know you're very quick to give the credit to everybody else. And it's very uh, genuine. So I accept that lots of people did great things, but you did a hell of a lot too. That's that's an interesting one to, to aim to be the calmest man in Croke Park. Because you, you think, and especially in the 90s, I mean, now we're used to looking at Jim Gavin and like, Jesus, if he takes a sip of water, it's like... You know, you know it's yeah. a big deal but i mean your era 90s like managers are on the touchline i think you know that era like Paddy or Mikko and you know the hurler managers as well like you're roaring lads on the sideline you're getting involved you're you're riding the emotion of the game i think so you you try to kind of center yourself and 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 and, and stay a little bit beneath that obviously look what i made up my mind when i was a manager that there was more to me than this that this is not all about me because if i start thinking this is all about me i'm going to make mistakes everywhere uh, if it's me worrying about fellas getting mad at me or whatever, if I'm going to start taking it all personally and trying to be to be all and end of all, I put a great team around me. I put Rory Kinsler. I put I only selectors I would have with me were guys who work with kids. They were the only fellas that I would take select. Uh, so Seamus Barron uh, was from Ratnewer and a great hurling man, and I played with him. And Rory Kinsler was an FC GM and Tony, a great coach and a great man, a good mind for the game. So. I had the good team around me. I picked mm. Sean Collier, a young lad who knew nothing about him. Absolutely zilch and zero. But he was a young man. He was had been boxer, kickboxer, very keen. And he was from my own parish. And he was going to do a job. And we did a job which we agreed. We agreed an entire, uh, all of the various periodizations of, 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 the, of the training regime. We sat down, went through it for hours. And then I would modify it to hurling as I saw it. And, you know, that kind of a team. And then we brought in Neil Fitzpatrick. We had a vote on bringing in Neil Fitzpatrick as a sports psychologist mm. because I studied sports psychology for a while. And I, I went to America to a friend of mine called Bill Bowen in Rochester University, who was a dental uh, dental researcher. And uh, he was very helpful to me because he was his father actually was Nicky Rackard's doctor. Uh, and so he, he was a very, he was one of the world's leading uh, the dental uh, researchers and got awards all around the world, actually. So... I actually went to those people because I did not, I did, I wanted to know that I was going to be best in class. My own brother was a professional coach in uh, in England and uh, I, I was on to him and, uh, you know, looking for other stuff. And we got all of the various things and kept using that information to move on. So we put together a good backup. So I'm just saying, without that backup, you couldn't do it. And if you're mm. going to try and do it yourself and say, I know everything, I didn't know everything. I absolutely didn't know everything. And I learned a lot from the previous managers and were before me from watching what had happened. So, like, they're a combination of all of those things. But I still say, and I'm not saying this to be falsely modest, you know, a, a good manager uh, is important, uh, but he'll never win you in All-Ireland. You have to be good enough yourselves. He might give you a wherewithal to, so that you can thrive in what you're supposed to be. Supposing you're playing that you can be put in a position that you can thrive in and that you can you can play to your best of your ability in that so that you feel comfortable. So then that's the kind of comfort zone if each individual player has that rather than sticking a fella in somewhere where it's, you know it's going to make him unhappy. Mm. Uh, we had one player who was particularly unhappy about certain areas, but we thought he could deliver for us. He didn't think he, he wanted to play there, but eventually he did deliver and only for him. I mean, might have won an All-Ireland. Hmm. So, but a bad manager will lose you an All-Ireland. Yes. But a good manager won't necessarily win you one because you have to win it yourself. And tell me that day, 2.23 to 2.15, an eight-point win against Limerick in that All-Ireland final. Did Liam Griffin manage to stay as calm as he was hoping to? I absolutely did, to be honest. Right. Uh, I Because that's, 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 I knew, look, at, I was always of the opinion from, under, from, training under, from training under kids. When you train kids in underage, you learn so much. I was playing in a, in a club that had no tradition of hurling, zero tradition of hurling. And when I was a kid, 
our club were given walkovers in hurling. We couldn't, we couldn't play. I'd been a sub in a Wexford team that won All Ireland in '65. I was having doing my Lindsay interest, and I'd been leaving, sir. And we won the under twenty one All Ireland, and I was on the panel as a sub. I came on in the All Ireland Intermediate final. So I'm 18 years of age. I'm not 19 till that September, and I'm playing at that level. Then my club entered the team into the hurling championship the following year, and I hitched from player, and we get a walk on. Like you know. What kind of a life was that for for a young lad that's trying to develop it? So when I came back to my own club and I started training the team and playing in football, like Ross Lair was predominantly a soccer place at that stage. So in my time, we had won some bits and pieces in football, but we were amalgamated with other clubs. So when you start, I felt we'd never have a GA club unless we developed hurling. So we started from scratch with hurling. So when you start from scratch, it's a completely different thing to start from scratch with a crowd of people whose families have no tradition of hurling and who don't know anything about it. So to build through that, you have to learn how to control to control a game. I know that sounds crazy for people in hurling, but you can control a game if you know exactly what you're doing and who can do what. You can actually control a game. And I felt that would carry it into adulthood. And why shouldn't it? Mm. So, but you needed like-minded fellas with you to be able to be thinking on that play without having to educate them to think about that. So I just felt that 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 controlling the game, I always felt either in control or out of control on the sideline. And I always had to be in control that I was able to control as best I could the game. In my deck of cards were there, and I had to try and make sure I could control that. But I then had a good system in place. Where, with Rory Kinsler and Seamus Barn, and we had a system in place. We had no meetings on sidelines to discuss changes. Hey, when you're having meetings on sidelines to discuss changes, your your ass is cooked. You right. know what, what was you the system? What, 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 what was the system, Liam? For every single player we had on the field, I would go through that ad infinitum for hours. Uh, so, if he breaks a leg, what do I do next? If the fellow beside him runs into him and the two of them break their legs, what do I do next? Who comes on there and who's best suited for that? And who on this panel can play there? Right now. Rory McCarty was a brilliant little hurler. Small man. I saw him murdered under high balls. Sorts of him. So what I said to Rory was uh, in agreement with the other people. When I say I, I mean we, by the way. Okay? So, Rory, you're forbidden from going under a high ball. Okay? You not be caught under a high ball under any circumstances. Now, I knew that if I offered him a thousand euro per game or to come out of that position, that he was going to opt for that. He, he, you know, but if you force a fellow like that, so poke the ball out and it'll be okay. Now, if it goes down on top of a guy like that that doesn't want it, it's not, not. Now, how can you use that to your advantage? Right? And we only played with five forwards most of that year. We brought him to middle of the field. A very clever fellow, great sportsman all around. Whisper his man out to the middle of the field. Leave us room behind. Martin Story had never scored against uh, Offaly Hardly in all his time. And we were getting no scores out of the three greatest halfbacks combination that we've seen, like, like uh, Kevin Martin, Hubert Rigney, and uh, Brian Whelan. Mm. Right? They clean you out uh, mm. out of there, right? And they, they played. They, I would say, they didn't even know themselves why the, the, the system they were playing. It was an automatic system, which is the best system of the lot that covered for each other automatically and so forth. So how do you break that down? Well, story needed room. So if we go out, he goes in. We could do all of those things, and we agreed how to do that for every position on the field, every time. And they went back and they did it backwards, right? When you got to the end, you started and went backwards again. Mm. What happens if Damien Henry breaks a leg? What are we going to do about this? So, well, we're going to call in a sub who never played a match in the league. We needed to speed Damien, Damien Fitzhenry Henry up a little bit. And he didn't like, he didn't like uh, training too much. He wasn't fond of the endurance stuff, right? So we brought him out and played him wing back because he played outfield for his club. We brought him out and played him wing back. And we put the sub goalkeeper in for the entire national league. And we put him on, he was, he was playing wing back and played very, very well a lot of games because we were using him as an extra man when there was no such thing as an extra man because he covered behind our full back line who played from in front. So he was job was... And he loved it. Get out. You know, we used to us standing between four, uh, two, four lumps of timber. Like, mm. if that ball breaks behind the full back line, it's your ball. Mm. So they know they can be satisfied as they go forward. The ball is behind you. So we're talking about getting into the minutiae right through everything. Now that's how you. And then you know that everyone's playing to that system, even though it's hurting and it's it's quick fire and it's fast. Yeah. Yes. If you can get that system, you can get a game that you're able to kind of say we're in control still. We're not. We're not going to fall asunder here. We're okay. And then all of a sudden, you know, it starts to come to you. you no. Know? So we actually said at the meeting before the All Ireland final on the Wednesday night, I got up and said, right, okay, lads, we plan for everything. So the ball is thrown in after the first five minutes. Liam Dunn comes out to catch a high ball in the middle of the field. Martin Story comes up the field. The two of them get knocked out. What do we do? Right. They're both carried out. What do we do? Dead silence. What, lads, tell me, what are we going to do? Right? Okay. Somebody says, bring on a bloody sub. That's it. 
because they're, they shouldn't be here because they're not capable of going on. So we're not beaten. We bring on two guys because we give them plenty of game time to people and we bring on the two guys, carry them off, send them to hospital, good luck, see you after the match. That's it. We just move on. No matter what happens, we deal with it. We don't, but we have to visualize it before mm -hmm. it happens. I was big on visualization myself and I, it wasn't my original thought on visualization. I was doing visualization without even knowing it myself. But when I went out to Bill Bowen, I looked up the Coaching Association of Canada. We, we started finding stuff and I wanted to do stuff on the psychological side and you could buy, you could buy a paper, an academic paper on any topic in, in sport from the uh, Coaching Association of Canada. One euro for a paper. I still have them here behind me. And you could pick them up and you could read it, academic, no bullshit, none of this Vince Lombardi, you know, losing is not the only, it's the, when it's not the only thing or it's the only thing. These are all cliches. They don't do anything for a player, tell them not going to test from the door. Give me a tool to play with. Don't be giving me cliches. So we need to give a tool. So we give them tools and we give a tool on the visualization side of looking at what you can do. See the move before you make it, make the move, you know, do those things. And the other thing then was, we had to say, what's the mantra? What, what do we get in our heads? So I looked up at a thing at some stage and I saw one for a guy called Fox, I think was his name. He won a, a gold medal, I think, in the Worlds or the, or the Olympic Games for rowing. Uh, I think it was sculling, you know, single sculls. So anyway, he was always nervous. And every time he went in the race, he was worrying, oh, I'm going too fast. I'm going too fast. I won't list this line. And he started making, you know, getting nervous. So your man, who was his coach at the time, uh, you hold the boat to list these fellas off. He's just had a mantra. And the mantra was that, this is what you're going to do. You are, you can only win if you get the best you can be. And if you want to get the best you can be, you've got to concentrate on your technique. Okay. Now, don't be concentrating on who's behind you, who's in front of you. You just do the best you can do and the best way you can race. And that's it. And you take a stroke. You start to worry uh, about a stroke and you'll miss the water. So as he's rowing, it's Fast and clean, fast and clean, fast and clean, fast and clean. In other words, the oar was in the water, it was in the right place. Because if he misses on one side here, at that level, you're, you're, you're beaten out the door. It's the same way with us. Like if you are going to miss the ball in front of the goal, and you, what do you do about it if you miss it? So well, we've developed our own mantra of next ball, next ball, next ball. Stay in the moment, next ball. How do you stay in the moment? Give me a tool to help me stay in it. It's next ball, next ball, next ball. And you could hear them calling it to each other when a fellow misses it. And if a fellow gets wide, I remember Eamon Cregan telling me you've lost the plot altogether. We were having problems with shooting. You know, we had lots of wides. So we started analyzing that and saying, right, you know, we can't have like all these wides. But you know what? Go for it. If you're going to go for it, go for it. If you drop the goal ball in, I watched the Ireland final football, fellas dropping balls into the goalkeeper's hands and uh, coming out with it. I'm just saying, no, no, and that doesn't work. More conviction on the ball. If it goes wide, you don't give out to the guy like we do in the field when the kids are there and giving out to him for driving a wide. That's negative and that doesn't work. So I remember saying Larry Murphy blazed the ball wide against Offaly. And I said, great wide, Larry, great wide, well done. And Ian McGregor said, well, you're fucking losing the plot going by. You know, and I knew him from, uh, from I knew him from, 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 uh, from Pin and Shannon because I knew him well. One of the greatest hurlers of all time. But anyway, and a grand guy and, and a great hurler man. But it's, it's, it's the detail, it's the detail. And if you're controlling all the little things, you can control the detail. But you need the knowledge. I didn't have it, so you go find it. Wow, so interesting. I wanted to ask you about something else. So I, I know, I think even threw it up on the board at some stage around this time, like what is hurling? You know, let's go back, let's, like, like, let's establish first principles here. What is hurling? And we need certain markers. And yes. what's really interesting, I remember Davy Fitz talking uh, when he was Wexford manager a couple of years ago, when he first got in there and he was having a big impact. And I remember him, or maybe it was second year. And he was, well, what, what was the difference with the first year it went so well and the second year not so well? And he said, our hooking and our blocking is down. And I yeah. thought, wow, can it be that basic? Is, is that, that is so important. And I was really interested to hear you doing an interview elsewhere. And you were saying that one of your key markers, I think you had about six of them, but one of your key markers was hooks and blocks. We're going to be the best hookers in Ireland, I think was the, the line. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Look at, I was trying to say, how do I measure performance? How do I get, how do we get, how do we get? our team to actually really play every ball within the moment defensively and then attack. What can we do to do that? So when you put the matrix up on the wall, that brings you to stats. So what we did, we had hooking, blocking, 
uh, you know, and for example, if your man cleared the ball, we didn't blame the man, Mark and the man who got the score. We didn't blame anybody. But we tracked back to where it started from by having that lie, by having that, because we got it by the individual. And the God may strike me dead. On a, on a Monday morning, we had a solicitor, a fellow called John O'Leary, a brilliant guy. He's two favorite things in life, hurling and opera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now he'd go down well in most GA uh, club rooms if you said this man's an expert on opera you know then they'd be saying oh holy Jesus Mary hmm. and Joseph what's going on here but anyway he was a brilliant man great head and we had him on, on the, up in the stand and he was given down to Seamus who was sitting down the all of the detail and Seamus was giving it to Rory and Rory was talking to me now the, and the moves and this is, sounds arrogant moves I made the decision and the boys agreed. I said, I'm the boss when it comes to moving. If the, if the SHIT shit hits the fan, I'll have to take the hammer. Now, I'll probably get the credit that I don't deserve for if it goes better. But that's the way it is. But we're not going to have any committee meetings. We're not going to go grazing grass up off the ground wondering what we're going to do next. If I don't like what you're telling me, I'm not going to do it. I'm taking, I'm going to veto it. But if I like what you're telling me, I'm going to do it. And that's it. So there's no arguments about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that meant that we had the team on the sideline operating as a team, as a full team. Neil Fitzpatrick was there as, on, the, on the psychology side. Mm -hmm. Once I finished with doing the psychology, which was, we brought it to a vote one time, uh, I, I left with Neve off and I said, that's it. And you know nothing about hurling. You stick with the, with the whole, that side of it. So that, that, uh, that operation worked. But as part of that, John O'Leary, would have the stats on my desk every Monday morning after a match at nine o'clock, right. right? I would wait for those though. I wasn't going anywhere on Monday morning for an hour until I looked at those. But I promise you, I could actually tell you the moves and I couldn't see it again because I hadn't time to be thinking through those things on the sideline. I was watching the overview, so I wasn't going into the minutia. So it gave me a chance to relax and not have to think about all these things because I knew I had it the next morning yes. if I needed it, right? So what you did then was you worked out. So you could say, okay, if you didn't hook or block, and if somebody wasn't blocking, and we had a mark around who was who was clearing, that meant that you could actually find out, like Martin Story's man. Like one day, Martin Story went berserk with me because I put him up on the board for minus two points. Uh, right? He had got one four or one three or something. Got minus two points, and of course the boys were all laughing at him, and he was looking at the board, and he goes, "What the mark, Christ? What's this about? How did I get minus two? Jesus, I, got, I was the best forward you had." I said, "You were," but this is what happened. X cleared that ball that time. I wound up in the back of our net. Yeah. That's one goal gone. Yeah. The so-and-so so -so happened. That happened as well. And, you know, but eventually he saw the merit of it. So a yes. bit of fun, but it kept everybody. And no, 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 I'll be, I'll, 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 I'm going to wind up at no score tomorrow after getting about six points here. Yeah. You know, it's a psychological thing. It's a subliminal thing, if you like. And did you get, so, did you get to a place then where you were watching certain games and you were hooking and blocking and putting pressure on and you thought, this is beautiful. This is it. Absolutely. I only watched, a fellow gave me a present, he was very nice to do it. He made a whole thing on a, on a memory stick for, of 96. Oh, well, he got it there a couple of weeks back often. And he said, I want you to have this. And he gave it to me. So, and I was very kind of him to go and do it for me. But anyway, I only saw the Kilkenny match for the first time ever. I don't look at those matches back to, too often. I don't ever try it. I don't have the videos written of them. I prefer to have it in my head, actually. You know, I mean, the memory is nice to have. But I've actually watched the, uh, the match between Wexford and Ossie. Uh, Wexford and Kilkenny in the first round of the championship in 96. And Sean Flood was playing cornerback. And I was surprised we had to pick them cornerback. I said, Sean, he's not. Well, we picked on the Mark Charlie Carter. And he had a marvellous game. So I was just telling somebody, I'm going to give him a ring now and tell him, Sean, by the way, that match, he had a great game. And knowing Sean, he'd say, Jesus, it took you 25 years to realise it. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is, they got through for a, 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 an absolutely certain goal. And you remember JJ Delaney put a great block on, on Shaney Callum. And as I said to JJ at a match one time there when we were playing hurling for cancer, the, everybody forgot that Jamie Callan got two five before that. And uh, the, the JJ got all the, the, the credit for this one hook, but mm. it was a vital hook as well. But Shawnee Flood got a fantastic hook. Uh, if, if they'd have got a goal that day, we were gone. And mm. he, he, made, he made the hook on it. So what does hook and a block and tell me? It tells me the intensity of our team. And if you're not out hooking and out blocking the other team, your intensity is not as good. Because don't forget, Playing by the rules meant a lot to me. I wanted to, I wanted to see us win something, but I wanted to do it in a proper way. And discipline was a fierce, important point for me in our game. Right, right. I did not want this given away for you. I was looking at stats 
Gary Kirby getting seven and eight points in matches and all these great free takers and he was great. We couldn't afford to do anything. If we couldn't give anybody, and I'm saying this again, without being boastful, the other fellas know this as well. I made a point, if Gary Kirby gets more than four points, we'll probably lose the other in the final. He got two and we won by two. Now, is that brilliant thinking? No, it's not. It's just a matter of focusing on something for a while. And so you needed to learn by hooking and blocking what exactly, how your team were doing in the intensity side of the game. Were they working hard enough? Because we don't, we agreed at the start, we need to do a lot more than other teams need to do for us to win. So we need to work harder than every team we're going to play. And if we don't at work and we won't win. Mm. And that's what we need to do. Indication of, of that. And the other thing we had with another mantra as well, which was if the ball breaks, I know I did it myself and the ball breaks before you and you wait for that split second for someone else to go for it, you're gone. It'll mm. be gone. Mm. So we had a situation was drive, drive. The minute the ball drops, it, drive. The minute you see it, the word you had, drive. And Michael Dignan, we won with Leinster final, went up to the bar and that was a great Offaly team. I thought they, I loved that team to bits. They were, they were great guys. They were, yeah. were absolutely fabulous yeah. guys. Honestly, yeah. God. Just, you, you, I don't know. I can see why, you know, they grew up together. They came through Burst CBS. They were just a joy. And uh, I'm so sad to see that they're not, that they've gone downhill a little bit. And please God, they'll come back. But we went up to the, to the, to the, to the bar after mm. the match mm. to meet the Offaly lads. And Michael Dyglin was there and he congratulated me and they were very, very generous, right? And he just said to me, Jesus, he said they were flying. He says, you know what? I was there looking at him and they were just driving by us as if we weren't there. And he used the exact words that we had mm. as a mantra. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. You know? And, 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 uh, and I know lads did deliver on it, did yeah. deliver on it. And in the dressing room, there's no point in dressing room at half time giving sermons because I've been in dressing rooms on occasions where I didn't even think this fellow is going to stop talking sometime now. And I'm a devil to talk myself. I know I am. But the point was that there's two key, key matrix that you have to, to concentrate on. And I always say it's three things. And after that, we're being superfluous. Get the three big issues out here. And we just throw them out there and say them and repeat them. And the power of thrice, say it three times, say it three times, say it three times and bury it in people's heads. If you don't do that, you're done for. OK, you have to do it. So we had a man down at halftime in the all Ireland final, which was the most unlikely man that I ever could imagine being sent off was Eamon Scallon. Now, he was very unfortunate what happened. There was a row broke out and, uh, you know, everybody got into it for a few minutes and Pat Horn was nervous, I'd say. Uh, and when he went to throw the ball in, Eamon Scallon went to pull and then he went to pull again. And uh, Gary Laffin stuck his head in behind uh, and it hooked his hurley and he pulled on his own so it, it looked bad it looked like as if he was pulling on but he did it wasn't it wasn't that mm. so he got the line now i know that when i was at the press afterwards i said if he deserved to get sent off that's that's fair enough now i, I didn't endear myself to some of his family members because they thought i wasn't standing up for him but i, I if i didn't see it by then i didn't know then and I, only afterwards i i saw it but mm. i'm just saying that we were doing with 14 men so the point in is in the dressing room like you go out there to get revenge against Limerick. This is the time we get back to discipline. No fouling, no fouling, no fouling. Discipline, discipline, discipline. We need to go to the second half. And we didn't foul in the second half and inside the uh, inside the middle of the field. Now, like I know that, uh, uh, you know, the, the Limerick fellas felt the next day that there was something wrong that they didn't get a free in the second half. But that was our game plan, not to give any frees away, not to give them away, because we couldn't afford to. Yes. And like, the lads stuck to it. But that was because we had a plan on that. That's all. No other reason. It's interesting. You mentioned Lee Fitzpatrick a few times, your, your sports psychologist who came in in 96. Obviously, you'd been there in, in 95, and you had a grounding in, in sports psychology, as you've said to us already, but you wanted to go for an extra level, level of expertise. Now, I know you interviewed a couple of people and you picked Neve. Well, what I thought was very interesting was that um, you really did put it to the team and you really did say, like, unanimous vote here. I mean, one of you has the power to veto this. And this yes. is a time where, you know, we, like not exactly the most progressive maybe country when it comes to our mental health or things like psychology. So there was probably a fear this will end up in the papers and we look like Egypts. In fairness exactly. to them, in fairness to them, they all said, let's do this. And I, I, I think you'll remember who one of them said, look, if it gives us an extra 1%, we'd be mad not to try it. So that was quite a, a mature move on their part. Well, first of all, we had a squad and everybody in the squad, like, Martin, uh, uh, I'm saying this, uh, Martin Story was our captain. He was always quizzing me at meetings, right? Now, 
like with some of the selectors and some of the backroom team, they they didn't like some of that. I actually welcomed it, right? Because, and I'm saying this, and I don't want to come across as being boastful about anything. I'm just saying the all the knowledge I accumulated, I got it from other people, yeah. and I put my own playing career in, into it as well. And uh, you know, and logically tried to think it through and dedicated myself to making it be the best I could be. So that's what I did. So I don't want to be. I'm just boasting. I'm not. But when we had the squad, it was a squad. So there was a, a, a worry sometimes that we were sharing things with fellas that weren't playing. We had no dissenter in our squad because we were open and honest and everything we said. And I was asked not to say, uh, you know, to say some things we'd say up to squad in case they go back and tell their parents or tell their, their sisters or wives or their mothers or whatever. And my answer was, no, I'm not going to do that. Everybody has to know. We just, we're dependent on, only for all of these guys, we wouldn't be here. And mm -hmm. there's they're not going to make the 25, but they're still our team and they're still part of who we are. So we're not going to do that. We're going to trust everybody or nobody. So I think that was good. And I think it was the right thing to do. So we did say, look, I, I had done uh, sports psychology. I actually went and did a, a diploma in sports psychology after it was all over. As George O'Connor said to me, Jesus, you're definitely a man who are, you went off and did it after all this. I said, yeah, but I've done a lot of it before. I've done a lot of studying on it before. And so yeah. that's what I did. So why wouldn't I put some academic qualifications around it for my own sanity? So yeah. anyway, I did that. But I wasn't qualified. I wasn't the best qualified. So we brought in, so we were going to bring in somebody. So like we'd gone through the National League, we got promotion at the National League, we got to the National League semi-final, And, uh, you know, we were going to go into the championship. So before we called a meeting and I, I just said, right, okay. Um, what about this? I've done as much as I can. I used to give him papers. John O'Connor admitted to me that at the start, I used to give him handouts on, on sports psychology. And like, I'd be fierce and enthusiastic about something that I've read. And my biggest problem, I was saying, I'm giving him too much. Am I giving him too much? So I'd, you know, I'd condense it and give him sm smaller amounts. But I said to him, read that when you go home and see if it makes sense. And John O'Connor admitted, and he's, he's a, he is a HD. Like, he's, I, I, I think, no, he's got, he's got a master's, has he? I don't know. But anyway, he actually told me way back, Jesus, he said, I just threw it in the bag sometimes. Like, and here is a guy with that level of intellect don't to do that. You're saying, I wonder. But anyway, so what happened was we said, okay, let's see, can we can we get this to the next level? Because again, if I was thinking that I'm the be all and end all here, right? I'm the man and I'm not going to give this job to anybody else because I want to be seen to be the man. The more you want to be seen to be the man, the less chance you have of ever being the man, to be quite honest. So we said we get this outside person. So anyway, I said, right, this is going to be voted on and it's going to be it was unanimous. If you're not, if, if it's not unanimous, we're not doing it. And I don't want anyone to say it to anybody because Tom Dempsey, who is a gas man, uh, wasn't fond of training mine, but is a gas man. And uh, he stood up and said, I think that's a great idea, Liam. wind up all over the Daily Star or the Daily Mail yeah. or somewhere. Wexford, Wexford hire hedge shrink uh, to win a hurling final. And we'd be laughing stock. And he was joking. And somebody else piped up then and said, I don't give a damn because if it gets us 1%, well, I said, right. And we'd agreed to shame myself and, and Rory. And we said, right, okay. If we do this, you're not to tell anybody. Absolutely nobody. Now, I know our doctor was annoyed afterwards with me and I still think he's still annoyed with me probably that I didn't tell him or level with him because he was our doctor. It was none of his business to be quite honest with you. And I felt that not to be disrespectful because he was a great man and a very good medical man and a very good man to Wexford as his family was before. But he didn't need to know, right? He didn't need to know. Neither did the county board need to know. This was part of a team. We were a team and we were supposed to do things that were the best of our team. So we weren't going to sacrifice it by sharing it with everybody else. Uh, so we, we shared it with everybody in that room. And I don't believe any of them told anybody. And everybody kept it. But anyway, we eventually agreed and we said, it's a show of hands. And they were saying, no, give us 15 more minutes. I said, right, you get 15 more minutes. And I kept the 15 more minutes, they wanted five more. I said, no, three more minutes, it's done. Keep talking amongst yourselves. And then we're going straight to a vote. That's it, okay? That's it. And they voted unanimously to, to bring it. There's a few reluctant hands going up, but overall, <laughs> yeah. they, they all went up, okay? Mm. Now, so then I interviewed three different people. I went and met, met them and interviewed them. And I met Neve, and I was really, really impressed with Neve as I am still to this very day, she's a wonderful lady and uh, just a fabulous person. And like we became lifelong friends and I have such respect for her. And then she had this terrible disaster with her sister Dara on the, uh, the flight 116 there last year in Mayo, which was dreadful tragedy, but she's just stellar. And when I interviewed her, I thought, yes, this is the person, right? 
because unfortunately, one of the guys was a very nice guy, started telling me he had some great ideas how to play hurling. Now, I was no dis disrespectful to him. I wasn't being disrespectful. I didn't need fellas coming in and starting to tell me, do this. We needed to stay focused with the three guys who had responsibility for that because everybody had their own job. Everybody had their own job. Do your job. Bring it to the table. Don't focus on anybody else's job. If it's impacting somebody else and even an issue with somebody, say it to me, right? And, you know, just say it to me privately so that we could just handle it, whatever it was. And it was very seldom with an issue or any issue, to be honest. So what happened then was we had the boys in the room for the meeting and they didn't know who was coming. And I said, right, I'm going to bring down uh, your new sports psychologist, right? We'll be down in a minute, okay? Brought her down and walked her in the door. And she was a young woman. She was under, under 30 years of age at the time and walked in. And I said, right, the headline on the paper now will be Wexford hire woman head shrink to win an All-Ireland final. How's that going to go down in the farmlands of rural, rural Wexford? Mm. <laughs> but anyway, you know, so, but I think it was fantastic to have a woman there because guys could talk to her like they couldn't talk to a man. They could talk about their human frailties. She never, ever, ever to this day, told me what anyone said to her privately or how they were feeling. And I did it was none of my business. I needed them to be able to be, to be right for the game and to back, go into the game plan. And she then was sitting in the game plan meetings and she was able to give them the keywords and throw the keywords at them and go through it with them. So like that worked as well. But like we gave that ferocious thought. We went to the bother looking for somebody. We went to the bother of interviewing somebody. We went to the bother of sitting down and talking for a couple of hours with people to see what we could get. So, like, in other words, we were trying to do everything to the best of our ability because we recognized as a team that unless we did everything to the best of our ability, we could not win anything. And so, therefore, there's no point in letting the team think that. The, the backroom team have to do the same. Mm. God, it's amazing. Clock has come against us. I knew it would. Did Dan, like, geez, what a, what a brilliant culmination of all the work and all the thought. And I, I'd say we've only scratched the surface at, at everything you, you did to win that All-Ireland. It must have just been the thrill of a lifetime, was it? Like, there was such colour that summer. I mean, even the bloody song survives. You know, everything about it kind of just landed for some reason. And the whole country kind of got a, got a sense of a special group working together in unison. I mean, there's just wonderful Do, like does that is that kind of the highlight in some ways of your of your i don't want to say your life because i know family is first but like how do you how do you compare that what you've done with your hotels and stuff i i can't think you had a bit a bigger buzz than winning that all ireland um no i had uh, no I, I this is ridiculous i know this is ridiculous people think i'm mental we won an under 12 county hurling final ah stop we stop 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 <laughs> Seriously, we beat Buffers Alley in it, beat Buffers Alley in it, in a county hurling final for a, for a small club. I never felt a feeling like it until, until the all Ireland final in terms of sport, because, like, for us to beat Buffers Alley, you have no conception, because you're not from Wexford, no. what it meant. And you know what? A cousin of mine from Buffers Alley came into the dressing room and said, <laughs> and I told him to get to be effed out of here, he said, well, boys, you're a right child crowd of chaps. He said, I never thought I'd say the day that a crowd from Ross Lair would beat a Buffer's Alley in, in a hurling match. <laughs> so, <laughs> and our kids are there that, that didn't even know where Buffer's Alley was. It's half of them. <laughs> he was, I said, get out of here, right? As quick as you can, you're saying the wrong things here. But mm. like, honest to God, I had put so much time into that that it was massively important to me. And I remember like the other final was something similarly put so much work in. So there is a parallel. I know one is a much at a higher level, sure, sure, but sure. From where we had come from. But, you know, I'm not... Like, the look that I have, I'm lucky. The reason I'm so lucky was, I was a child in the, in, in, at the end of the 50s. I was a child when Wexford were absolutely the kingpins. I was a child when Wexford fellas carried Christy Ring off the field and after winning the final. I was a child when Wexford were the most sporting team in Ireland. I was a child through all of that era. And from the time I was five till I was 18, Wexford contested almost half of all the All-Irelands. I had two cousins playing on the team in 1960, uh, John Nolan and Pat Nolan. Pat Nolan was in the goal. I used to drive Pat Nolan mad. I was in the Wexford dressing room all through the end, uh, end of the 50s and early 60s. I used to go into the dressing room and sit beside Pat Nolan. And I remember Podge Kehoe putting everybody out of the dressing room. Kids used to get into the dressing room at half time. Like, mm -hmm. it seems crazy. But Podge would clear them all out to make a speech because Podge took over from Nicky Racker. And he used to make the speeches at half time. There was no manager making it. And I sat in there. I was in there. 
and I used to go out, go out to the tap and wash Pat Nolan's boots and bring him back into him. You know what? And I used to, you know, I went to Wexford Park on a bicycle and, and go home with the bike. I'd be solo and home from Wexford Park with a bike, a horn on the bike. You know, it was just, I was inculcated with that. Nicky Racker to me was God and so were those fellas. And, you know, when we weren't at the matches, when there was too many crowds, you went, you listened on the radio and in that terrace of houses, that match blared out through those windows. And I was sitting in there, the youngest of everybody. And then they used to put me in the goal and pepper me with shots of the football. So, because football is the game there. Mm. So what I'm saying is, I felt that Wexford were invincible as a child. I could not ever accept to this day that Kilkenny were superior to us as a hurling body. They were playing under a different template, but I couldn't accept it. So I, I really felt that we were trying to recover, you know, who we really were. As well. It was a much bigger, bigger project than just winning the Ireland. Yes, it, was yes. to us, it was to get our flag and put it on top of the mountain and say, like, we're Wexford and we're proud of it. Because that, that had a huge influence on me. And I'm pleased to tell you that Myself and Martin's story brought that cup the day, the day after the final, and we put it on Nicky Rackard's grave. Because I said to him at the grave, there would have been no Martin story, and there definitely wouldn't be any Liam Griffin, only for that man. Mm. Because he had led Wexford, and he led them single-handedly, and he led them out of a, a, out of a barren field. He wasn't in a field of gold like in Kilkenny or a field of gold like in Cork. He mm. led them from a barren field with two brothers. And like that, other, that team became, to me, the godsend. And Ned Wheeler and myself were great friends, and Billy Rackard. And the final thing I'll leave you with is that Ned died last year. He was one of my best friends in life at the end. And he was a member in the club in Ferry Carrick. And we used to work out together at the same time. And Ned was just a fantastic man. But we have a deal that when I'm gone, he's going to get me a half an hour on the, night, the 56 team. <laughs> I'm going to get one <laughs> half of the 56 team. And we have a deal. Uh, so I'll hold him to it when I get okay, there. Okay, do. I, I, one tiny last one. And that is a fitting way to finish. I was very struck by that image of you going up to the place of pilgrimage the night before the final and having a private moment. Was there a moment in the minutes, hours, days, or even weeks, you know, I guess the euphoria lasts for a while, even the weeks after the uh, win, that you cherish a memory where, I don't know, you shared it with somebody or maybe it was a personal private one, or is there any memory of those, uh, that, that period after you win where it kind of hits you or that, that sticks with you now all these years later? Well, don't forget now, my wife uh, contracted MS on the, the Christmas Eve of 95. And she was diagnosed that day. And it, like, I went down to the beach and I walked along the beach. Um, and I remember screaming with kind of, you know, Jesus, how does this happen? But anyway, so I have to tell you that when, when I, my, I was training a Wexford team at this time, and I, I wasn't going to tell Mary and I wasn't going to tell the family until after New Year's Day. So like through that period, I used to go for walks and things about. And the one thing that uh, that that I, I, I want to do, I, I said, I just cannot train this team any longer. It's just not, this is immoral. I have a wife with MS, the kids, four kids, but you know, this is just not right. I shouldn't be doing this anymore. So I'm going to jack it in. So actually when, when we, we trained over Christmas, but I felt I'm going to resign after Christmas and that's a fact. So I sat Mary down and said, right, look at this is not right. Uh, and we talked about it and we got over the. We did a lot of crying for a few hours. But mm. after that, mm. I said to her, look, this is it. I'm finished with Wexford. And she said, no, 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 no. And she said two things. And to, to this day, like she probably didn't even remember probably the way she said it because she was distressed as well. She said, I don't want publicity. I don't want people thinking. I don't want people and me coming, getting been dragged into this because of my condition. I don't want that to happen. And you've had these young, young lads for so long, you know. So we agreed that I would go the minute we were beaten. So that focused my attention as well. So when I tell her that she's been a major part, I won't tell you what she call, says to me, you know, but she does. She said, no, for God's sake, are we talking nonsense? But like, that made me really focus. So when that final whistle, well, I knew I was gone because I had made that pact and we had agreed that pact and I was never going to break it. I'm gone. Now I wanted to stay on. I'd like to stay on. I said I'd do three years. I wanted to do the three years. So I felt I'd be letting the players down, you know, as well. So th that was a bit of a heartache as part of it. I knew it was the end of the line, but the special moment this was for me would be the Nicky Rackard moment. I'd say would have been a very special moment for me. But the other thing was that 
I got great satisfaction because every time I was going to Crow Park when we were getting beaten, I used to go home totally frustrated and totally frustrated at some of the fouling we were doing in matches at one stage. I used to say, oh my God, why are we doing this? Like, we're kind of, you know, and why are we trying to think that pulling on guys is going to make a difference or why that's not our way this is not our way because i'd seen the old wexford and, and i'm not saying they were all doing that but we we're doing silly stuff as well so like i had planned my own i felt i was doing game plans in my head of how i could try and win matches at that stage so i was so delighted for every single one of our players every single one of our players but particularly george o'connor i have a poem up there that was written by tom williams about george o'connor it's fabulous like and it's you know his first chance his last chance on uh, uh, on hurling's green bower there's a line in it his first chance his last chance on hurling's green, uh, green bower and, and that's such a fantastic line of a poem right and george dropped to his knees and uh, mm. George is actually a cousin of mine. His father and my mother were for cousins, was for cousins. So, like, I, I would look to, my heart was to break for him and, and John O'Connor as well at the time. So everybody on that team that were there for so long, they were great hurlers and they got their just reward. And that really gave me great satisfaction to know that George in particular, Billy Byrne, who Wexford, had, uh, Wexford selectors dropped in 93 because we lost to Leinster Kilkenny in the Leinster final and Billy was a, was targeted for, for that and dropped off the panel. We brought him back in and he, he won an Ireland for us, to be fair, because we did another thing. We wanted to have subs on the bench that we knew were game changers. So we told Billy Byrne and George O'Connor, we probably will not start you, but will you stay with us? Mm. And you know what those two guys said? Billy Byrne says, I'll do whatever I'm told. I, if you want me a sub, I'd go for a sub. And George said exactly the same in two separate places. Whatever you want. I'll go into subs. That took big men. Your professional fellas sulking now and want to leave, leave their club because they're not getting a game, you know, mm. and they're not playing well. Mm. But we mm. use the two boys, and I'll never forget, if you don't have something behind you on the, on, the, uh, on the line, you know, it's okay. Look at Ireland last night in soccer. Look what they brought on. The, 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 you know, the Serbians brought on some terrific players, right? And Ireland then were demanding of Ireland to be as good as some of those. They weren't, but they played very well. But anyway, so these two guys are standing behind you, or sitting behind you. So you knew when things were going wrong. That was part of our game to bring on Billy. And we had a methodology when we brought on Billy. We changed our game plan to high ball into the edge of the square. And we, we delivered that. And everyone knew the ball goes to Billy in the middle, of, in front of the goal. Because you know what? I don't care what to talk about uh, the modern day in hurling. I don't care what to say about non-stop holding onto the ball. The danger area is still in front of the goal. That's the danger area. And if you don't put sufficient ball in there, you won't get goals. You need to put them in there. And that's it. And as a fella came there, can't fight for it. Why shouldn't he have to fight for a ball as much as the fella's centre field? Just because there's an extra man in there. Okay, the ball goes over the bar. But there's ways of beating that system too, don't forget. If you mm. want to think about it long enough, there has to be. Anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you got me wound up. Ah, uh, listen. What a way to finish. The fire still burns. Uh, Liam Griffin, thanks so much for the time. I just enjoyed that. That was an education. So uh, listen, I'm sure everybody at home enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Joe. Thanks very much.